Welcome back to the Tom Hartman Program. Dr. Stephanie Kelton with us, Professor of Economics, Chair of the Department of Economics, in fact, at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, Editor-in-Chief of the New Economic Perspectives, blog neweconomicperspectives.org. Dr. Kelton, welcome back. Thank you. And thank you for staying with us um, for, for another few minutes here. Uh, I'm curious, you have, you have this graphic, uh, and, and in fact, uh, Jim has it as a graphic. We're going to take a full screen right now so people who are watching TV can see it. Um, basically, what it shows is that as we generate government deficits, the, the red below the line, that that's reflected by private sector surpluses blue above the line, above the zero percent line. And that there's some green in there, the foreign sector, which is our balance of surplus payments or deficits, the money that the extra that is either coming in or going out as a consequence of our trade deficit and other, other ways that our country makes money or loses money internationally. And that these three sectors are in balance, and it looks like whenever our government manages to balance its, bu its, its budget, that the private sector surplus collapses and we have a recession. D this seems counterintuitive. Can you explain this? Well, okay, yes, and uh, I love this graphic, and I'm so glad that you're able to put it up for the folks who are able to, to take a look at this uh, watching your program, because this really um, is a game changer in so many respects. When people begin to see things in this alternative way, because we've been so trained to think of the government's deficit as just a purely negative thing. And, you know, if we could eliminate it, well, by God, we ought to eliminate the deficit and balance the budget and so forth. And what we fail to, I think, recognize so often is that the government's deficit has to be considered in context. So when the government deficit spends, let's say the government spends 100, but they only collect back 90 in taxes, we label that a deficit. And the word itself sounds like some, you know, it's got a negative connotation. It sounds like something you want to avoid. But remember that when the government spends 100 into the economy and only takes 90 back out of the economy, that the extra 10 goes somewhere. And where it goes is into the non-government part of the economy. So either into the domestic private sector, you and I, the businesses, right, households and businesses in the U.S., or some of it could go abroad. It's possible that the U.S. contracts with a foreign producer of, let's say, uh, aircraft carriers, and they get a government contract. Well, then it would go into the foreign sector. But the big point is, from this graphic, I think you see a couple of things going on here. One is, you can tell it's a perfect mirror image, which means um, the world is a closed system. Every payment out of one sector goes into some other sector in the economy. And what the other thing that you see is that almost all of the time, the government is in the negative. That's the red that you see below the zero line there. So the government is almost always spending more than it takes in, which allows other sectors to take in more than they spend. And the, the simple way of saying that in everyday language is that it allows somebody else to save. And the the people that we want to be able to save money is, you know, folks like you and me and our, our private businesses to be able to take in more money than we spend. And in fact, it's the government's ability and willingness to run those deficits that allows the private sector to achieve those surpluses. And you can see what happens when the private sector isn't allowed to run those surpluses or chooses on its own, let's say during the, the Clinton years. What happened during the Clinton years? You had a, a dot-com bubble, you had an emerging housing bubble, you had American consumers feeling like suddenly they became very wealthy because their stock portfolios were gaining in terms of value, their home prices were beginning to go up, and so people start using their homes as ATM machines and they start saying, well, I can afford to take on some more debt because look how wealthy I am on paper. And so for the first time, really, as your viewers can see here, the private sector started spending more than it takes in, running the deficits. Mm -hmm. and. And for period after period after period, the private sector continued to, we say, dissave, to spend more than its income. And at the same time the private sector was doing that, it's paying more to the government 
than the government is putting back in. And so we built those surpluses. You know, the Democrats love to point to the Clinton years and they love to say we were the party of fiscal responsibility. We balanced the budget. We had budget surpluses as if those were necessarily a good thing. And in fact, they weren't a good thing. They set the stage for the um, the economic downturn. We had a recession. And then we had, of course, the mother of all financial collapses uh, since the Great Depression in 2007. So the private sector really needs to live in surplus territory. It can periodically go down and, and run a deficit. But over the long haul, the private sector can't spend more than it takes in. Private sector needs to be in surplus. The government, by its willingness and its ability to spend more than it collects in taxes provides that cushion for the private sector to save. So what is the role in all of this of international trade? Of trade? Yeah, we ran trade surpluses for literally centuries, and, and China and Japan and, and South Korea and Germany are all running very large trade surpluses right now, and it seems to be cushioning them from the consequences of any sort of um, public sector debt, or for that matter, private sector debt, were, w- would it not be to our advantage that y- this foreign sector, the green I'm seeing, is almost all above the line, and yet I thought our foreign sector balance of trade was negative. Is this a, a, a negative? Are we looking at double-entry bookkeeping where negatives become apparent positives, or a- am yeah. I missing something other than the trade deficit? And would it not be to our advantage to have a trade surplus, and would that not allow us to reduce the government quote, debt, end quote, and, and maybe diffuse some of the, the, the Rand Paul hysteria. Yeah. Well, you're, you're right. In terms of the, um, the current account, or we can just call it a trade surplus for shorthand, uh, plays a very similar role to the government's deficit. So in countries like Germany, where they're able to run uh, trade surpluses, it allows their government to run smaller budget deficits. In fact, there's an economist by the name of uh, Nicholas Caldor who uh, nearly a hundred years ago said that a trade surplus is like an artificial government deficit and vice versa, that the government's deficit is like an artificial trade surplus. And so in both cases, if the government is spending more money into the economy than it's taking out by running a deficit, it has the same sort of impact on the private sector as when the rest of the world buys more from us than we buy from them. So so, so, so Ross so, Perot is right, we should have a trade surplus? Well, I didn't, I didn't say that, though, right? I'm okay. saying in a country like the United States, where you can run these trade deficits, which allow more dollars to go out of the country than are coming back in, okay, that's true. But in the U.S., you can offset that with a government deficit that allows you to, to put more money back in than you're taking out and dampen the effects of that trade deficit. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. So, so you can actually use your fiscal policy to engineer full employment domestically. We could do this. We could have trade deficits where the rest of the world is producing things more cheaply than we can produce them here. There are some things we can't produce here. And so we get goods and services produced in other parts of the world And if we don't get our economic policy right here at home, then yes, that tends to increase the level of unemployment and economic distress and so forth. But what would happen if we actually understood the way the monetary system works, we understood that all of these barriers that we think are there aren't really there, we took advantage of our fiscal space, we got our policy right, we got full employment here domestically so that we could consume all of the things that it's possible for us to produce here at home, plus anything the rest of the world wants to produce and sell to us. Wouldn't that be the best of all possible worlds? It seems like it, yeah. So it's just a matter of saying, of having a government policy of basically the government being the employer of last resort. Would that be a reasonable way to say it? If, if the well, pro- 
Okay, so that's one program that um, many many people working in the in this tradition of this uh, school of thought that you know is is often referred to as modern money theory. One of the things that we've talked about is how to get the economy to operate in a more stable way. So sta stability in terms of the financial side and also inflation. And so what we have done is over a period of twenty years or so come to the conclusion that. Um, uh, you raised this, so I'm going to get into this. Uh, we have just one minute left. An employer of last resort, uh, uh -huh. a program where the government guarantees full employment by uh, offering to hire directly anybody who's ready, willing, and able to work and not able to find work in the private sector. And so that creates a buffer stock of employed people that can then flow into and out of the private sector as the economy naturally cycles, and that that would actually help to provide price stability. It would be an inflation control mechanism. And so you, you would have full employment, you would have price stability, and you could have all of this in an open economy world in which the dollar is still the reserve currency of the world, and you're able to run trade deficits as well. Remarkable. It's Dr. Stephanie Kelton, economist and chair of the Department of Economics at the University of Missouri in Kansas City, editor-in-chief of NewEconomicPerspectives.org blog. Um, Dr. Kelton, I know you have to go. Thank you so much for being with us these 45 minutes.